<laughs> okay, can you, is the mic on? <laughs> says it's on. Yes, we've got you. It's green? Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, I see we have a really mixed audience, so I'm going to try to concentrate on showing pictures of things that we've seen in on the sun and soft pedal how we did that. Um, So let me get at it. Just a couple of comments. When, when I became director of the observatory about 20 years ago, we wanted to build the most powerful solar telescope in the world, but you don't want to build it any more powerful than is needed to solve the problems that you have. So how powerful does it need to be? How big? does it need to be? First question. And then, you know, the sky at night, the stars twinkle. If you um, go into a city and look at street lights 10 blocks away, they twinkle too. It's a problem of turbulence, turbulence in the atmosphere. And can those problems be solved? And not only that, the distortions that you have in the, in the Earth's atmosphere come in uh, various layers. So, you know, how are you going to deal with those problems? The good thing is that this is an era where there are all kinds of new technologies, and new technologies are really fun to deal with. And one of the most important ones is called adaptive optics. These are the six um, largest solar telescopes in the world. And they all have what's called adaptive optics. And adaptive optics corrects for the distortion in the atmosphere. And the, the problem is that the light that comes, say, from the sun or the street light, it, uh, it changes its path 100, 150 times a second. So somehow, you need to be able to have technologies that can correct faster than that. And then the question is, how big? And this is a simulation of the surface of the sun. And this distance is about 3,000 miles across here. And if you take and just degrade that to what you would see with a half meter telescope, you don't see much. With a meter, you see smallest, you can make a large solar telescope so that you can resolve all of the problems. That corresponds to being able to resolve about 40 miles on the surface of the sun. Um, what does that mean? Supposing you had a really tall tower and put that telescope this telescope, forgetting about atmospheric distortion, could resolve and see the two uh, quarters separately. Um, can't do things yourself. You have to have partners, domestic partners, international partners. How much does it cost? You have to raise the money. For the telescope itself, for the hardware for the telescope, uh, we raised $12.5 million. And then for the instrumentation, another $12.5 million. But more than half of that is for the adaptive optics. And we used to have a half meter telescope, sort of this aperture, which was the standard for two generations. And now this is the first telescope built in uh, one generation that, that um, can really resolve 
things that we need to uh, see. Well, okay. This is a picture of the dome of the telescope. It sits out at the end of a thousand foot long causeway in Big Bear Lake. And looking that away is to the west. The wind comes from the west. We have two miles of open water to the west of us. And the enemy of, of a stable image is turbulence. So you get sunlight on the ground, the ground heats up, and you know when you uh, drive in the summer on a hot road, how everything shimmers. Well, the lake has exactly the opposite effect. It's cooler than, than the air, so all of the turbulence is pushed into the lake, and you have much better what's called seeing or less turbulence at the, um, at the ground level. Needed a new dome, and um, I won't say anything more about that. So this is what it looks like inside, and it's a strange-looking telescope. People who don't know anything about telescopes say, oh, that's a telescope. People who are experts at building telescopes say, what the heck is that thing? Because it doesn't look like anything that they've seen, and we decided to make a technological risk for a good scientific payoff, and the risk wound up making the telescope look strange. Sunlight comes in this way. Usually you have the mirror, and then the light goes and hits off a secondary mirror, so there's some, some blockage of your signal, and you can't really get rid of that, and that makes it really difficult to look at the sun the way we'd like to. So we made it off axis, so it goes like this, and over to here, and there's nothing, no obscuration, nothing blocking the light in the uh, path of the light. But that makes the telescope, made the telescope much more difficult to build. The telescope itself is a scale of the giant Magellan telescope, except we only have one one mirror, and turns out, for reasons I won't talk about, that saved us $2 million. Now, this is, this is from a 10-meter telescope, and it's allowed to heat up over the day, and you look at it, and what do you, you would think that, oh, I want to see this whole field, but here's your secondary mirror, and then here are all of these supports for the secondary mirror. So that's called the spider. And somehow you have to get rid of that spider or try to minimize it. It's really a difficult problem. And on top of that, they made it out of little segments of glass. So you can see the outline of the segments. So it's really good to make your, your mirror out of one single piece of glass so that you have a nice, smooth, in this case, would be red image everywhere. So this is what the cutaway version of what the telescope looks like. Light comes in here, goes up there, then down here. And the first stop that it can take is we have a cryogenic spectrograph. This is the size of a grand piano. I don't want to say much about it except that we have to cool the camera to 400 degrees, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit because in the infrared you have heat and heat gives a different kind of turbulence. And then we have the adaptive optics down below and all kinds of instruments that we built for measuring magnetic fields. Uh, let's see, do I want to... You know, in science fiction, you hear about computer-generated holograms. This was one of the first uses in astronomy of a computer-generated hologram. The problem with an off-axis mirror is that it's not a parabola. It's not a, and so when you're polishing it, how do you measure it? 
And the trick was to use a computer-generated hologram which takes the spherical wave out of the interferometer and converts it to what um, the shape of the uh, mirror that you want. And when we were doing this, there was only one place in the world that could make one of these big enough, and that was in Siberia. So it took us five iterations because of language difficulties and specification difficulties. Anyway, that's a story for another day. So in January of 2009, we obtained first light, and um, these bright things are called granules. The sun's surface, the heat comes up, then it cools and it goes down, back down around the edges. So you see the dark edges. So you can imagine heat flowing up here and then flowing out to the sides and then down into the lanes. And that's what's everywhere on the sun's surface. So it worked somewhat. You can. Then we processed the data so it was so thoroughly processed that it had no scientific value left in it. But you could see, say, this what we called pearl necklace. And these are the individual fibers of the sun's magnetic field. They're about 40 miles across. And we're, we're looking 93 million miles away. And they're about 1,000 gauss in strength. But if we just take this image and reduce its quality so what we, we, we get what we would have seen with the old half-meter telescope, the pearls are gone. And OK, so but anyway, we were happy. Uh, now, we've had three generations of adaptive optics, and we've been on the, the leading edge of this. And uh, this is where we are now. I'll come back to that later. Now, why adaptive optics? Last time I was in Big Bear, there was a fire. There's always fires in Southern California. And Forest Service, this is our helicopter, picking up water, and it's just taking off. And look through the blades of the helicopter. Look at the trees behind. That's just turbulence generated by the blades of the propeller. And that's why the trees are smeared out. And that's the effect we have in the atmosphere on a larger scale but smaller size and makes it difficult for us to get um, our images. So what happens is the principle of adaptive optics is really simple. Um, the devil is in the details. Imagine that you have just a plane wave of light coming in and then it gets aberrated by the Earth's atmosphere. So all you need is it to bounce off a mirror that just has the opposite shape to the uh, distortion in the wavefront, then you get this nice smooth wavefront and you're done. But the trick is, how do you do that? And uh, what do I want to say about that? Not too much. Um, let me just skip this and I'll just say what the problem is and not really say too much about the solution. We have a camera that takes a picture of the wavefront. It's 400 frames by 400 frames. It takes 2,000 frames a second. So it's like drinking from a fire hose. And now it somehow has to go and those signals have to go to each of these little boxes and tell a little piston to push and change the shape of the mirror. The mirror is about this size, costs half a million dollars, but it's about this size, has 357 of these actuators. 
they, the, the stroke of the actuators is about a tenth to a fiftieth of the, uh, the width of a human hair. But it's enough to change the shape of, of the mirror so that it can compensate for the distorted wave that you get from the atmosphere. And so the first set was the first adaptive optics we did in collaboration with our colleagues from the National Solar Observatory and the Kiebenhauer Institute in Germany. And so we, we all had the same system. The second generation, um, this one, which is more sophisticated than other observatories have, we built in-house because we felt we wanted to be able to control our own destiny. So now, here's what a spot looks like with adaptive optics off. And now, you turn the adaptive optics on, they correct a little bit. And then, you do some post-processing on the images. You know, you've seen on television, like, um, say there's a robbery in a convenience store and they have a video camera and it points to a car and, and say it takes 10,000 images and not one of the 10,000 images has the license plate, but each one of them has a little bit of information. And what we do is the same thing that these guys do and we restore and get the information back that's hidden in a long burst. So this is where we were with our first uh, what's called diffraction limited imaging that we got in 2010. And a French magazine paid us a very high uh, compliment. So this is a sunspot in, um, in a red, pretty red color. But you can see all of the details. You see, you see, the uh, sunspot looks like looks like a daisy with um, a thousand petals. And then you see the granulation, which is everywhere, which is how the heat gets out of the sun. And here's the same sunspot, but you're looking a little higher in the atmosphere. And now, these are, these are jets that are being ejected from the edge of the sunspot. And the width of them is, again, about 50 miles. So these are things that nobody had seen before. So uh, there's a Japanese satellite in space, and we took an image of the same place at the same time. And you can see the difference. Everybody says, go to space, you'll get much better images. But the problem is that you have this heavy weight that you have to live into space, lift into space. So you wind up with a smaller aperture and sim simpler instrumentation. So many things that you can do, you should do from the ground. And this is from 2010. That was a time when the sun had no spots for almost a year. And what you can see is the granular field. And you can, I mean, I, I've watched this movie for hours. And every time you watch it, you can see something different. See these uh, bright things here? These are, again, those uh, bright points that are the magnetic fields. So. It feels like this, and here's the surface. And now, the theorists would have told you that those bright points were actually in sheets. But if you watch the movie, every last one of those sheets, somewhere in the movie will do this and come back together. So it's a matter of resolution. They're not in sheets. They're individuals. So let's see. So then, we put the, the next generation of adaptive optics in, which was much more sophisticated. And what we thought was great in 2010, we decided well, it wasn't so great because in 2013, you could see much better and much more detail of sunspots. This thing's called a light bridge going across here. And inside the uh, umbra, which you might think is black, you see all these white spots. They're called umbral dots. 
and they're not, they don't behave at all like the uh, theories say they do. And here's a movie to show you how dynamical things are. And you can watch this movie over and over again. You can see waves coming out along the penumbra, the petals of the daisy. You can see all of the twisting in the, um, in the light bridge. And then you can watch and you can say, hey, the granules are much smaller right next to the uh, sunspot than they are away from it because somehow the magnetic field underneath the surface is squeezing them. So what do we have? The theories of how these light bridges work, they're wrong. The theory of how the sunspot gets, has these umbral dots, they're wrong. And then you have all of these things coming into the sunspot, going out from the sunspot. If you watch up here, you can see this, the penumbra working its way in. And then these cameras we have are 16 bits. You can't see 16 bits. So here's a kind of trick to try to, to illustrate that. Here's a light bridge. It's a different sunspot. See this dark line along the light bridge? The light bridge actually comes up high enough in the atmosphere that it's cooler than its surroundings, so it looks black compared to its surroundings. So it's not that it's become black, it's just as warm as the rest of the light bridge, but it's just higher and it's living in a different neighborhood where everything else is hotter. Um, then we have, we built hardware to measure magnetic fields in visible light and in the near infrared. And here, here's a first light image from, this is in uh, the light of hydrogen. And this is a scan across the line. So up here in the wings of the line, the top of the line, you're seeing the surface. But in the middle of the line, you're seeing higher in the atmosphere. And so this line is really powerful in studying the dynamics of the sun because by scanning it, you can look at different um, altitudes in the atmosphere and see different kinds of dynamical effects. But It's very nice to look at. Now, this is really cool. In fact, this was actually in Nature Magazine um, last summer. First on the right, whole disk of the sun looking at this area. The, box, the rectangle here is from space, and so this is the uh, flaring that's seen from space. This funny shape um, object is our field. We had some problems in the setup, so instead of having a, a square, a rectangular, or a round field, we had one, two, I guess, uh, octagonal. But what do you see in this? So first, you see, see the flashes? The flashes, that's the flare. So you have the magnetic field, it's complicated, wants to simplify. And now, a different kind of black lines coming down from above, and it's called coronal rain, and they're bringing down charged particles. And now look when the coronal rain hits the surface. Right there. See how there's bright spots? is actually thermalizes the surface. So you have charged particles that are brought down from above, come down, hit the surface, and give off energy. Um, this is the kind of resolution that we get now. And there are enough frames in this to make a movie, but I only have one. 
unfortunately. But you can see again this light bridge and this dark line across because the light bridge is high in the atmosphere. Then, um, this is not the whole sun. This is now just a round aperture. And it's, it's about 30,000, well, 25,000 miles across. But these little fibers we discovered, they're in, in the, high in the atmosphere in the corona, there are these magnetic loops that you see, um, like on television when NASA has its press releases. But these are 10 times narrower and 10 times cooler. And what's interesting about them, probably the oldest problem about the nature of the sun is the surface is about 5,000 degrees Kelvin and the upper atmosphere is more than a couple of million degrees Kelvin. So how can something that's cool heat something to be very hot? And nobody's been able to explain it. But for the first time, we can see something, which is that these, these dark loops, they start from the, from the bright points in the intergranular lanes. They start from some magnetic disturbance, and then they come up and then when they reach the corona, you can see them in the satellite images. So you can see the energy being fed from the magnetic fields at the surface all the way up to the corona. It, it certainly is part of the story. And so we were quite happy with that. Now, here's another kind of uh, flare. And flares are caused because you have magnetic field, and the sun doesn't rotate uniformly. It rotates faster at the equator than it does at the poles. So the magnetic field gets stretched. And at some point, the magnetic field says, hey, I have too much energy in me. I don't like this anymore. And it explodes. And then in, in the explosion, you get the energy released of the flare. That's the brightening. And then the field reconnects to a simpler form. So here, there's the original field. And now you see the flare, the two elements of the flare going away. And now the simplified field comes in and it's in a different direction. So that's what's called magnetic reconnection. And it's all kind of simple dynamics. Differential rotation stretches the field. The field's had enough pops, releases the flare, and then the field reconnects into a simpler format. Now here's another one, and it has, it has a different story. And the story is that at some point in there, I mean, in the textbooks, they tell you that Flare happens at a point. At some point in here, you'll see the flare, but it's happening everywhere at once. And you're looking at, you know, 25,000 miles across. Bang, see? Right there. It happens everywhere at once. Well, that presents a few problems because you would like to be able to understand what's happening. And but you're not, but you have a, a problem, and that is the adaptive optics only corrects this little bit, and then you've done a post facto correction like we saw before, but that relies on all of the frames being basically of the same thing. Imagine going back to the, the story in the parking lot. Imagine that instead of a license plate that you're used to, it had, the license plate had spinning numbers. And now you could take all the pictures you want, and the spinning numbers, you wouldn't be able to reconstruct them. So that's one problem. The second problem is that these things are not local. They happen everywhere at once. 
So by doing this reconstruction, you force, you say, take 100 images and make one of them. So you have a 10 second cadence. But whatever is happening is happening maybe a second or a tenth of a second. So your cadence isn't fast enough. You can't trust the reconstruction. And the data tell you that it happens everywhere at once. So you need to be able to have a technology that can correct the entire field of view at once. And that's where we've been for the past few years. Um, basically, let me not show you that. Let me just make a, a general remark, a few general remarks. The turbulence in the atmosphere comes in three places. The first is the one you're used to, where you, the sunlight hits the ground, the ground heats up, and the thermal comes off of the ground. The second one, you may not know about, but actually you do. And that is that those thermals that come up, at some point, they deposit their water. And that's maybe four or five kilometers high. And you see the formation of clouds. If you think about it, close your eyes for a second. You can remember times that you've seen clouds that were absolutely flat on the bottom. And that's, that tells you where that boundary layer is. But most of the time, the, it's not flat. That means there's turbulence there. So that's the second place where the images get damaged. And the third place you know about, too, and that's the jet stream. And the jet stream arises because as the Earth rotates, the heat is trying to get from the equatorial regions to the polar regions. And after some work, you can construct the jet streams. So the problem it is soluble because you don't have turbulence everywhere in the atmosphere. You just have it near the ground, near the bottom where the clouds are, and near the jet stream. So that doesn't mean it's easy, though. Um, let me skip that. And Oh, actually, let me go back. And we measure the turbulence. This is two days a week apart. And the size of these tells you, there's, tells you the size of the turbulence. The blue is the total. So there's some at the ground, and then there's some near the ground. And then up here where the jet stream is, there's nothing. Then a week later, there's turbulence at the jet stream. There's turbulence here at the uh, boundary layer. And then if you, if you look at, at the, um, the maps that you can see on weather underground or whatever, you'll see that uh, on the 28th, the jet stream was over Big Bear. And the week earlier, it was over the state of Oregon and Washington. So sometimes, uh, and, and you can just tell by looking at the images where the turbulence is to some, to some level. Ah, oh, so um, here's the setup. I won't go into any detail, but here are the three deformable mirrors. One, two, three, half a million dollars a piece. And this complicated structure is made because the turbulent layers can change their position. And so we, we made the design so we could just move one deformable mirror and its partner. And so you could change the altitude that you're correcting for in less than a minute. And that's an illustration of it. So I can tell you how much um, a cook plate costs in Big Bear. It's $9.98. Why would I want a cook plate or a hot plate? Because we put a hot plate in front of this deformable mirror, in front of this deformable mirror, and in front of that deformable mirror. And so we don't turn on any adaptive optics. And this dummy image looks really bad. Now we turn on one deformable mirror, 
and you can see some correction in the center. And we turn on all three, so we know that the setup should work, but that doesn't mean that the real atmosphere is going to cooperate with us and that the real sun is going to uh, help us out. But finally, we did succeed, sort of. What we'd hoped for was the moment where you would just say, wow. Well, here's what you would get with a single deformable mirror. And then it's alternating between that and correcting with, with two deformable mirrors. And, eh, you know, it's a little better, but nothing to write home about. Uh, well, that's just proof that it worked. And we have several different systems, setups for the systems, because everybody has a theory how to do multiple, con multiple multi-conjugate adaptive optics. And some people will tell you, first you correct near the ground, then you correct higher up. Some people say, no, correct higher up, and then work your way down. And everybody is positive they're right, and nobody has any data. So it's just the way science is. So we built our system so that we could test every hypothesis. Well, that's not quite the reason. We didn't know which one was correct, but if we didn't build it to meet every hypothesis, supposing we missed one and that was the correct one, and then we'd be screwed. So, uh, I'll skip that. So finally, we had the aha moment just a month ago. And here on the left, take a single deformable mirror, take 150 frames, and just drop them one on top of another. Boom, 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 boom. And this is what a movie looks like. So you see this correction from the single deformable mirror. And then it's a blur out here. Next, flip the switch, turn on a second deformable mirror at the boundary layer and a third deformable mirror at the um, jet stream. And you get this full correction. It couldn't correct the way it's designed any larger than this field of view. And you can see the bright points and all of that. So, and it was when we were sitting there you know, you're watching the screen and you're seeing the images and they sort of look okay. But this time it was finally, oh my God, this is really it. It really works. And it wasn't, it was everybody in all five of us in the room at the same time. It was a really nice moment. But what, is it, what does that mean? Now, we'll be able to take images of dynamical events like flares. And instead of having a 10 second time cadence, we can have a 10th of a second or even faster. It only depends on how fast our camera is for taking the data. So we'll be able to see what looks like continuous all the way across the field. We'll be able to see the real origin. We won't have to reconstruct the image, so we won't have to worry about something um, being funny or wrong in the reconstruction. And the downside is we'll have so much data that um, I have no idea how we're going to store it all. But there are a whole series of problems that we're going to be able to solve because, and, and by the way, nobody has ever done, this is the first time in uh, daytime astronomy that anybody's made multi-conjugate adaptive optics work. And only the Gemini telescope in, in uh, South America has made it work at night, and it made it work at night in the infrared where the problem is easier. The shorter the wavelength of the light, the uh, more subject it is to turbulence. But this is um, visible light. So this is you know, one of those moments that's why you got into science and the fact that, that the technology that's available enables you to do things that people couldn't have imagined 
even 15 years ago. Okay, now, um, what's our future? We've been in, in operation since 2009. The technologies keep improving. There's this four-meter solar telescope that's on the horizon, which will be online in about um, five years. So we will still have multi-conjugate adaptive optics. That's a national facility that, um, that's being built in, in uh, Maui. And so people will be able to do three-day runs. That's all the time you'll get. But if you want to study uh, dynamical events, you want to be able to track them across the sun. And then when they come back around, attract track them again. So we'll be the only high resolution place that can work in, in campaigns. And also, um, we're the instrument test bed for the four meter telescope. And, and in fact, um, the guy who's in charge of the four meter telescope was an NJIT postdoc 25 years ago. And, and so we worked together on the adaptive optics uh, for the last almost 20 years. So um, that's all I want to say. This is a picture of the moon. We try to measure things, on the, and you can see turbulence through the uh, contrails of, of the jet. So thank you for your attention, and thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> no, don't, don't wake them up. <laughs> So any questions?